when I was in the Baptist church, the pastor said, Book of Revelation is too hard to understand. And so that's why we don't study it. I would like to tell you everything about the book of Revelation in five words. Let me illustrate it with this story. There were some young people playing basketball, young adults playing basketball. And there was a janitor who stood to the side because they were in a community facility and he was waiting. Once the game was over, he was locked up. One of those young men who was playing had his master's in theology. And he knows from time to time that the janitor, as he was waiting, would be reading his Bible. And he thought to himself, well, I have a master's in theology. And this janitor, he's doing good if he has a high school education. He probably needs me to explain to him the finer workings of the word. So one day he got up his courage and he decided, I'm going to go see that janitor. And he's got close. Hey, Donald, you want to crank us down a little bit? As he got close, he noticed he was reading the book of Revelation. And he thought to himself, I spent years studying. I have a master's. And kind of like a rooster strewed in me, he said to himself, I'm going to explain this to him. So he said to the janitor, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Yes, sir. He says, Well, would you explain to me what the book of Revelation is about? And he says, in the end, Jesus wins. That's what the book of Revelation is about. Amen. That's the end of the sermon. <laughs> I invite you to the 14th chapter of Revelation, the first angel's message. Chapter 14 is in a very strategic place because in the previous chapter you've been, you've been reading about the Antichrist and its attack on God and God's sanctuary and on God's people. These and on the other side of the first angel, first three angels message is the judgment. And so you have these three angels that have a message to a world that has been seduced by Satan into a, a state of rebellion, into believing that they can either earn their salvation or that there's no God so they don't need to worry about it. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Did you notice that? Another angel. What angel is he talking about? Well, if you go back to the 10th chapter, John writes about an angel who gives John a scroll. And he says, eat it. And when John eats it, it's sweet in his mouth, but it's bitter to his stomach. And John is telling us about the, the birth of the Millerite movement who was preaching the imminent return of Jesus Christ, October 22, 1844. Now, that, the Millerites were in major contrast or even conflict to the Protestant church because the Protestants were teaching the soon arrival of the millennium. And they were expecting a thousand years of peace. Church being raptured. A thousand years of peace. 1840, 1844, October 23, was a dark time. And the expectation of Jesus was sweet to their mouths, but when it didn't happen, it was bitter, and it was dark. Fifteen, some 15 years later, April 1861, the American Civil War broke out. And the dream of a thousand years of millennial peace was, was shattered. So John is telling the middle of the believers, don't give up. There's still a message to be preached. Another mighty angel in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel. And the reason John calls it the everlasting gospel is that he wants us to realize 
that throughout the gospel had been being preached throughout the Old Testament and been preached as the life of Jesus and that gospel has not changed. The whole message of God's word is salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. We cannot save ourselves. Even though the, the devil is doing everything he can to deceive us, to convince us that we can pull ourselves up by bootstraps. And the angel of chapter 10 puts his foot on the sea and on the land. And the angel of Revelation 14 <coughs> are preaching to peoples of all nations, tribes, and countries, symbolizing that both of these messages, both the pre-advent message of the Millerites and the three angels' messages were a worldwide message, not limited to just a, a small group in the New England area, but would be spread throughout all the world. A warning about the beast power. And if you hold there in 14 and flip back to chapter 13 and verse 7, you see the threat of the beast power. It says, it was also given to him to make war, it's referring to the beast power, with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation was given to him. Verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth who worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. And so Satan has his worldwide activities. He's created his own sanctuary. He's created his own priesthood. He's created his own methodology of salvation. And he has been very effective in deceiving the world to believe him. And God in chapter 10 and again in chapter 14 is calling people back to worship Him. And Jesus tells us that one of the signs of the soon coming of Christ is Matthew 24, 14. And this, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world as a testimony to all nations. And then what happens? And the end comes. And the three angels as a final message that God has given to his people to share with the world. And then John transitions. In verse 7, where he says, And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Notice he says that the gospel is preached, the angel's message is preached with a loud voice with clarity and, and decisiveness. And he says we are to fear God. It means to be in awe of Him. To be in respect of Him. To give Him glory. And to fear God or to be in awe of God leads us to repentance and to transformation. Revelation 15.4 says, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify Your name? For You alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Fearing God brings us into a more intimate relationship with Him. Not fear like scared, but fear with a sense of honest. A sense of realizing He's our Creator. He's our God. We are not a mistake. We are not the result of some amoeba. We are not the result of some big bang. We are each and every one individually created by our Creator. And we are dependent upon Him. How much do you trust God? Well, let me illustrate the story as you think about that question. There was a man named Jack who was walking near the edge of the cliff. He was the man of two seas, curious and careless. And he got to the edge, and the, and the edge began to crumble, and he fell. And as he was falling, he was, his arms were waving, and he saw this branch and he grabbed it. 
And as he looked down to his horror, there was a thousand feet before he hit the ground. And he began to yell, you know what you would do? Help? Is there anybody up there thinking maybe somebody would have a rope that could rescue him? And he screamed for hours. Well, it seemed like hours. It probably won't, was only a few minutes. And nothing. And then suddenly he heard this, Jack. <coughs> Jack. And Jack's looking around and he says, Yes, I I'm here. Who are you? Where are you? And he says, I'm the Lord. I'm everywhere. Jack says, You mean you're God? He says, Yeah. Jack said, Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I'll stop sinning. I'll go to church. I'll return a faithful tithe. And God said, hey, Jack, easy on the promises. Let's focus first on rescuing you. But God said, Jack, I need you to listen very, very carefully. Are you good at listening carefully? He said, I need you to listen very, very carefully. Jack said, Lord, I'm listening. I will do whatever you ask. So what do you think the Lord asked Jack to do? Let go of the branch. And what was Jack's reaction? What? You've got to be kidding. God said, Lord, God said, Jack, just trust me. Let go of the branch. And there was a long pause. And Jack screamed out, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> Ever felt like Jack? You want to do God's will? But when you find out what it is, it seems like it's too hard to handle. It sounds too scary, too difficult. And we decide to look elsewhere. Jesus tells us that in discipleship, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. See, God isn't trying to make life more difficult for us. He wants us to know that He's always there. He wants us to know that it's okay and safe to let go of the things that we hang on to and to trust Him. And when we let go, that's when we find freedom. When we let go of the things of this world, the temptation of this world, that's when we find freedom. And that's the appeal of the first angel's message. Letting go and trusting God. Fear God and give the glory to Him because the hour of judgment is come. The first angel was referring to that first phase of the judgment, the pre-advent taking place in heaven before the second coming of Christ. October 22, 1844, Jesus transitions to the most holy place. Judgment begins. So before we have the presentation of the judgment, at the end of the millennium you have the enactment of the judgment. The righteous are redeemed and the wicked are destroyed. And the first angel's message makes it very clear. But those living in the end of earth's history are divided into two groups. <clears throat> those that trust God and are obedient to Him, are faithful to Him, and those who are in rebellion to Him. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, the, conclu in the conclusion, when all have been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments. Because this applies to every person. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. It's kind of funny how people try to hide from God so they can do their acts of rebellion, thinking He can't see them. Paul says, We all appear before Him. 2 Corinthians 5 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each and each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good. Or bad. Revelation 14 is an end time message of hope, of redemption, of reconciliation. Fear God and give glory to Him. 
And in the second part of that phase, John says, or the angel says, and worship me. One group is worshiping God, Revelation 13, 4 tells us. Another group is worshiping the, the dragon. The worshippers of God are those who have their names in the book of life. And those who worship the demon or the devil do not have their names in the book of life. Nice music. <laughs> Worship God. In Revelation 14, 12 says, Here they keep the commandments of God. And in the heart of those commandments is the Sabbath, which reminds us that God is our creator. And reminds us to remember. Reminds us that evolution is not the answer. It is the problem. We are called to remember to keep the fourth commandment. That we honor God. That we respect Him. That we trust Him. Now, Millerites were not Sabbath keepers. And the early believers, the early Adventists, well, they, were, they were discovering and there was a, a young lady named Rachel Oaks. One author describes her as aggressive. And this is where the author says, is one of their members, she was a Seventh-day Baptist. She says, one of their members, an aggressive woman named Rachel Oaks. Now, I'm not sure what it takes to be aggressive. Maybe it just means she spoke up. Challenged an Adventist preacher belonging to the Methodist church to keep all of God's commandments. As a result, Frederick Wheeler began to observe the seventh day Sabbath in the spring of 1844. 1846, Joseph Bates, James White, and Ella White accepted the Sabbath truth. For the Baptist, the Sabbath was merely the correct day. But for the early Adventists, it was a fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. It was an in-time response. You know, Moses called his people and he said, he said to them, You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded. We are called as proclaimers with a loud voice the three angels' messages. We begin with that first angel. Fear God and give glory to Him. It is a message of hope. It is a message of salvation. You know, a lot of people who, who struggle with their relationship with God, and Satan <coughs> keeps bringing up all their past mistakes. But I'd like to illustrate to you how God sees it. You ever watch ESPN? Well, don't raise your hands. But. They always show these highlight reels. And you see Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and you see LeBron James. You see all these guys shooting baskets. And if, you, if all you ever knew about these athletes was what you saw in the highlight reels, you would assume they never made a mistake. Isn't that right? You'd assume they, they, they always scored baskets. Well. The three angels' message tells us that God washes away our sins. And when he looks at us, he only sees perfection. He doesn't see our sins. He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees his perfection over our names. And the mission of Satan 
is to convince us that we cannot trust God. God has called us as a people to sound a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to Him and worship Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you have, that you rose up the Millerite movement. And out of the ashes of that movement, you rose up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Lord, thank you for the responsibility that you have given to us to be that loud voice. And thank you that it's by your power that we can speak for you. And thank you, Lord, that we're saved by the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing song, uh, number 319, Lord, I want to be a Christian.